You're the ones who love that granola as much as I do, and you show up right in time to hear the best speakers at SOCAP and to get this amazing book, which I'll tell you about in a minute. I'm Lindsay Smalling. I'm the producer and curator of SOCAP. Welcome to Thursday. Hopefully you've already had an amazing time networking on Tuesday and at that great first soiree that we hosted on Wednesday, a full, full day of content yesterday. And I've really loved seeing all the energy as I walk through the pavilions and through outside. My goal for today is to actually go to some of the content that I spend so long putting on. So I'm looking forward to that. Maybe I'll see some of you in sessions. So in the program book, also in the 10 year anniversary book, I have realized it's helpful for people to understand how this all comes together a little bit. And because you're here, you get to hear it. So uh, the way every year this conference comes together, it starts brand new from scratch because this field is growing so, so quickly that the conversation really does change. In some ways, we're having the same conversations that we had 10 years ago. In planning for this 10-year anniversary, we looked at the SOCAP 08 program book and it could have been the program book for this year. I mean, so many of those people are still the leaders in this field today. But there are subtle differences, and that's one of the fun parts of my job, is really listening for how is the conversation changing and where is sort of where's the energy in the room right now. So last year, for those of you who were here and those of you who weren't, uh, some of the themes last year are around both the why of impact investing and the how of impact investing. And that so often uh, we sort of are getting deeper into the how, the metrics conversations, the I innovative structuring, sort of how are we getting this capital out, but making sure that the why is still staying, staying really central and a key piece of that conversation. So had speakers last year that really dug into both of those. And as I was listening this year, 10 years in, we're hearing a lot of great stories about what's happened in the last 10 years. But what I was also hearing so much of was that we still have to do better and that there are still so many blind spots and there are so many ways that this field can, needs to continue to sort of hold itself accountable, to be really rigorous about being clear about what the goals of impact investing are and not get caught up in sort of the glamour of feeling like this is better than the, than the current system to really hold that rigor. So that's what we're going to explore throughout this plenary. You get the, the head start to know sort of how all of these pieces fit together today. And I'm really excited uh, to have our first speaker here today whose book is on your chair, Morgan Simon. I actually remember my first SOCAP. I was a volunteer. And as I sat in one of those chairs, Morgan was on a panel, and she looked so young, but she'd already been doing this work for five, ten years, because she started as a college student, uh, being a sort of a student activist at Swarthmore. She founded the Re Responsible Endowments Coalition. She had started Tonic. And you'll see all of those stories are in real impact, but this is someone who really constantly has been holding herself accountable and continues to push the field in amazing ways to say, we have to really get to the roots of this. We have to be very intentional. And I'm really excited for you all to hear from her. So please welcome Morgan Simon. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all for being here bright and early on a warm, breezy Thursday morning. Um, and it's my real pleasure to be with you in that I've been in the field for about 17 years now, influencing over 150 billion in capital, and in my current work as managing director of Candide Group alongside Anir ben -Ami, over the last five years, we've supported over 50 companies and funds in doing this work. And it means that I have a lot of time and opportunity to really think deeply about this word impact. And I, I really love the Merriam-Webster definition of the word. 
to impinge upon especially forcefully, right? We think a lot um, about impact as this positive force in the world, but it could be a positive or negative force depending on how we as imperfect human beings engage with the concept. And that's the opportunity that we have to really see what the future of impact could be, how do we make this as positive of a phenomena as possible. And it's an especially critical time to be thinking about these questions because if JP Morgan is anywhere near right, if we're gonna get to two trillion in impact investment, that would be 10 times as much as official development aid. And that means that the way that social change is happening at a global and domestic level is rapidly shifting under our feet. And one of the things that gives me a lot of encouragement is that the impact investment field overall is fantastic at organizing towards objectives, that there's been many major questions we've had to answer over the last 10 years, and I'd posit that they've largely been financial, that we needed to prove that impact investment had merit as a financial industry in order to not get gobbled up by a financial industry that had often been very hostile towards the very concept. So there's three questions I feel we've answered quite well over the last decade that we've shown that impact investing can be market rate, that we've had studies from Deutsche Bank to Harvard Business Review showing that you can actually get superior returns through sustainable practices, so check one. Is it an asset class or is it an approach that you can apply across an entire portfolio? That too, we've seen a number of asset owners prove that this is absolutely a cross-asset approach that you could have 100% alliance between your money and your values. And then finally, the question of could impact investment scale? Was it just going to be a couple of pet projects or did it have the opportunity to really become much more widespread in society? You know, of one in every $5 in some type of screen vehicle, about 8.7 trillion, and you've seen funds like TPG closing at 2 billion. So regardless of asset level, there's really been the opportunity to show this is an industry that can scale. So this was phenomenal progress in terms of solving those financial questions, but I'd, I'd argue for you know, any uh, weightlifters in the house, right? if you just do your bicep curls and you forget the tricep, you're kind of missing the whole strength, uh, the collective strength of having impact and investing equally strong and functional within your, your system. And that if we've managed in the last decade to focus and solve a lot of really important financial questions, could this be the decade of impact? Could this be the opportunity to make sure that we are equally strong in our impact practices? And that might mean needing to organize around and solve a very different set of questions or an, addi an additional set of questions. So here's three that I've been thinking a lot about. One, is impact going to create gradual or systemic change? And when we think about the fires in Northern California, the hurricanes in Puerto Rico and around Central America and Caribbean, of course, how are we going to get the type of systemic transformative change that we need to really be able to move forward as a society, to have a world that's there for our grandchildren? And in order to do so, can we balance our skill sets between finance and social justice, that often to become investment professionals, we do our seven years of education, we take those internships, we take the time and attention that it needs to learn those skills. How do we equally make sure that we're training this next generation in industry to be equally skilled on impact? And that means not just reading the New York Times, it means how do we really make sure to be keeping in touch in a much more proactive way with civil society and retaining accountability as we do so. And then finally, how do we build a more inclusive industry? That if we know the majority of the world is women and people of color, how do we make sure that we have more people in decision-making positions within this industry? And I'll note that that's not just about diversity or representation, which are, are of course important, but in really thinking about that social justice adage, nothing about us without us. That if we want to be effective as a movement, we need to make sure that we have accountability to the people who we presumably are all here to support. And I want to note that this leads to me the, the one of central questions that I'd say we have at this moment, at this juncture in the impact field, of who's going to set the agenda for impact investment. Because even if we have impact or social in front of the work we do, it doesn't mean that we have a social license to operate, right? That that is something we have to continuously gain over time. And that there's financial risk implicit in losing that social right to operate. So I want to give a couple examples of impact investment gone right and impact investment gone wrong to give a sense of how important that community buy-in is and what do we need to do to really shift leadership in the industry as we scale. So I want to start off 
taking us on a journey to the south of Mexico, to the state of Oaxaca, which has some of the best wind energy reserves on the planet. And the Mexican government, alongside some development banks and impact investors, saw this incredible opportunity to build Latin America's largest wind farm, $550 million project, the opportunity to bring economic development and jobs to an indigenous region, while also creating a fantastic renewable energy source for a country historically very dependent on fossil fuels. So this sounded like a great idea, a great impact investment, and it absolutely was to everyone except for the people who lived there, who started putting up roadblocks and carrying signs saying, transnationals, get out of the country, we are completely against the wind corridor, because they were being asked to sign contracts in Spanish instead of their indigenous language of Zacoteco, that they were getting compensated $50 a hectare and found themselves collectively getting 12,000 hectares taken from out under them. And in the context of this community protest, they started to have a number of clashes with authorities. Nine people were shot, including women and children, to the point where you had the indigenous commission putting out statements like stop the intimidation, hostility, and violence associated not with terrorism, not with oil and gas, but with wind energy. And these are three words that I never want associated with impact investment. I don't want associated with anyone in this movement or anyone in this room. But it shows what happens if we're not really thoughtful about community perspectives, if we don't put those front and center, we can lose our social license to operate. And we can wind up really getting derailed from what our purpose was in an industry. And this story to me kind of epitomizes some of the challenges that we've been seeing in the sector over the last decade that investors and entrepreneurs at times are profiting not alongside communities, but at the expense of communities, and in part because the impact gets defined by the investors and the entrepreneurs as opposed to the communities themselves. And part of why this is is that it's often very challenging for people who don't have friends and family with financial resources, as much love and support as they may provide, or are, don't have access to business plan competitions. How do we make sure that a much broader group of people get to really participate in this movement? So these are some major questions. And what I feel really great about, going back to what I mentioned of the financial questions we'd solved over the last decade, we as a community are great at organizing and solving problems. And that's what I would invite everyone in this room to be a part of doing. And the way that I've been trying to do so is as co-founder in my volunteer time of a nonprofit called Transform Finance, supporting executive director and co-founder Andrea Armeni, where we've been building a bridge between finance and social justice. And to build a bridge, you have to do it from both sides. So in terms of the financial community, we built an investor network about two billion strong. It launched at the White House in 2014 when it was a much more hospitable place. And that has brought together investors who have an explicit social justice focus to their practice and recognize that we need consistent inquiry to continue building that. And then in terms of building bridges to communities, we run trainings for social activists, community leaders, nonprofits who are interested in impact investment but may not have much of an introduction to finance who want to learn how they can think about earned revenue for social movements or how to keep impact investment accountable as it scales. And this is just one of many organizations that have been working to really try to center impact in the next decade. So how do we do that in practical nature? And at Transform Finance, we think about three main principles that we try to invoke in investment work and that we use as well in my practice at Candide Group. So I want to just share those three principles and an example of each to give you a strong sense of how this can work in the world. So going back to that community in Oaxaca, and a great example of a project engaging communities in design, governance, and ownership, it turned out that the indigenous community came together and said, we get that wind energy isn't the problem. The problem is not getting the economic benefit of wind energy. What if we started a community-owned wind farm? And this is one of the opportunities that's been getting launched, that's on its way, um, but showing that you could have a different way of really engaging. The second of adding more value than we extract, and in this case, this is um, New Era. It's a 17-member worker-owned co-op in Illinois that was financed by the working world, which is a fund that really pioneered that practice of non-extractive finance, of how do you make sure that when you have a group of owners, worker owners, um, that you're making sure they receive the primary economic benefit by having different investment structures that really serve their needs. And then finally, 
balancing risk and return between investors, entrepreneurs, and communities. Uncommon Cacao is a company that has been working with farmers around the globe rather than just paying the two cents a kilo additional that fair trade provides for cacao, um, of really looking to provide the majority of the benefit to farmers, recognizing the risks they take on. So these are just three of the stories that are highlighted in Real Impact, the book that I'm so excited to share with you today. And the purpose of this book isn't to provide answers to how we're going to do impact over the next decade, but the idea is to really highlight the questions that we can all take on together. So I hope that you'll join me in that journey, and thank you so much.